Okay, I think we'll kick off. Probably more people will um, drift in. My name's Vicky Hurd. I'm the farm campaign coordinator at Sustain, which is an alliance for better food and farming. We have about 100 members, and we work on all aspects of food and farming policy, but I focus on farming and supply chain. And I'm going to be um, moderating a discussion about the politics of food. So that's what we're talking about here. If you're in the wrong room, that's the, do stay. Um, so we've got a fantastic panel. Um, we've got uh, Professor David Barling from the University of Hertfordshire, Caroline Drummond from LEAF, um, Chief Executive, and Professor Tony Allen um, from King's College. And I've asked them all to say a few words about the, where the politics are at as far as their work and their concerns are. And I, I, you know, I think it's important. I, I think the last two days have been fantastic. Um, hugely grateful to the Cherry family and everybody involved for putting this on. Um, and it's a lot of practical and, and a lot of very, very important discussions going on. But I think we do need to think that all of it is in some way political. There are politics about a lot of the, the restrictions you're under, a lot of the, the support you get or don't get. Um, it's taxpayers' money that you do or don't get. Um, we can't avoid it and we shouldn't avoid it. And I would encourage what, what I would hope farmers and farming communities would be getting more political, um, and particularly this farming community, um, for obvious reasons, to actually demand the kind of support, the kind of regulatory framework, and um, the kind of public support that you deserve. And you do deserve a lot of public support. Um, so my work is entirely political, so it's wonderful to come into this environment, but obviously I've got an hour to talk politics. And part of that should be about money as well. That's what I'm working on a lot, trying to get the value down the food chain from new markets, from um, uh, the public support, the three billion that, that currently goes in public support, getting it further down the chain so that farmers, workers, animals, and the environment um, get the... the um, reward in, from the marketplace or from the subsidies that they should have in order to do the kind of farming that we need for the future. So I think politics and money are, are, are very much two sides of the same coin. So um, that's, that would be my penny's worth to kick off. How do we make that happen? How do we ensure that the money goes to where it's needed in the supply chain, i.e. you? Um, but I was going to kick off with um, Professor David Barling. Thank you. If you could come up, probably easiest. Thank you, Vicky, and uh, let me just say it's very nice to be here, and how wonderful the Cherry family have been in setting this up. John, um, Paul Cherry is also on the university court at the University of Hertfordshire, and we're very grateful that they allow us to use plots up here for some of our plant scientists to do their work. So we have a close relationship, and of course, um, we see ourselves as representing and working with Hertfordshire farmers as well. However, I'm not a plant scientist. My area is food policy. And in terms of food policy, it's an area that I entered into back in the 1990s with a group of others who were then based in West London, subsequently the Center for Food Policy at City University. And we laid out three areas that we thought were important to integrate a food policy around, three principal areas. They are the environment, health, and social justice. Now, after 20 plus years of working on that, I've settled for just getting them connected, let alone integrated. And what I want to do now is look at the UK picture from my perspective. Certainly there are very big issues which are global uh, in terms of the politics of food, and I'm very happy to discuss those from questions from the floor later. But let me just rattle through five or so things that I think are very important at the moment uh, in this period of Brexit. And I do apologize if I cover some areas which were covered yesterday, but I'll be brief. The first thing is uh, we obviously have the Framework Agriculture Bill due out uh, next month. Now, there's some good news there in the sense that some of the directions that are being muted seem very progressive, particularly in terms of the farming environment. Uh, also, DEFRA as a government department, having been emaciated in the last decade, is now on the up and has some very talented people joining it working night and day, no doubt, to get this framework legislation sorted out. But within that, we will have more specific sector 
details for each farming sector, uh, which will be coming out as secondary legislation in the year ahead. And that, of course, will need rigorous scrutiny. So the framework bill is only the start. The second thing to mention, I think, is that when I look across the food chain or the food sector, from agriculture through to the final food consumption, I see lots of fault lines there. And the fault lines are partly that, uh, although it's called Health and Harmony, the agriculture white paper, in fact, health is governed by the Department of Health and the Food Standards Agency rather than DEFRA, and the connections between the two have come looser rather than tighter. Uh, even Gove himself said to the House of Commons a couple of weeks ago that he can't deal with food standards because that's the joint, the responsibility of the FSA and in turn the Department of Health. And if you're looking at uh, dietary health and the impacts of dietary health, the adverse impacts, clearly those responsibilities are first and foremost with the Department of Health. So while we might look for more healthy means of production, which lead to healthier outputs in terms of, of uh, crops and food products, uh, the products they go into, uh, that's only part of the story. Getting those connected is still uh, a problem. And that is a problem that I think Gove hasn't uh, been able to address yet. Um, the third thing is that if I look at um, the area, whole area of food standards, the standards of our finished food products, we've seen tremendous progressive uh, advances in the last three decades, two and a half decades, food assurance schemes, a whole range of environmental and social schemes which are privately governed. But the state does endorse these. It endorses the Red Tractor, it supports them. Indeed, the Red Tractor has delegated authority in other words, it can more or less expect itself. And if we take a look at the inspections, we see at the Three Sisters uh, chicken processing plants, all sorts of problems with how that's actually monitored. And at the same time as we have this setting of standards, we have a, a weakening of the uh, inspection of these standards. As local authorities have had their budgets drastically cut, so has food inspection. And we see that problem with the food standards. We also see the, the Elliott Review Committee of a few years ago, which looked at food fraud in the wake of the, ho of the horse meat scandal, has said categorically that it set up the apparatus for better networking within the food industry and food supply chains, but it can't work without implementation, and the money for implementation is not adequately there, as I've just mentioned, and they have complained about that. And we're seeing that come through in cases like uh, the Three Sisters poultry plants. The fourth thing, is the value chain itself. How can you make a profit in the value chain if you're farming? That's a key challenge. We see the dairy industry in particular has been struck with this. I'm actually one year into a four-year project which is looking specifically at this across Europe. It's Horizon 2020 funded called Volumix. It's looking at um, value chain networks and dynamics. And two key areas we're focusing on now are fairness and market transparency. And those are two key areas we need to focus on to go forward. We've got an extremely good and well thought of throughout Europe uh, adjudicator for our grocery code. So the grocery code adjudicator, um, Vic and I were at the conference on Monday, extremely successful in bringing the retailers to heel on certain practices which disadvantage their suppliers in the food chain, but they only cover the retailers. They do not cover the manufacturers or food service. The European Union has just come up with a proposed directive on unfair trading practices in food chains, and it's focusing on all of the chain, not just the uh, supply to the top 10 retailers. Finally, and the last thing, is that in terms of trading standards, in terms of food standards, these are going to be compromised or could be compromised or possibly strengthened by whatever trading deals we come out with. We all know that actually, at the moment, the future of our food standards and indeed the agriculture standards depend on what the trade negotiations are with the EU at the end of the Brexit negotiation period and how those then spill over into bilateral negotiations with other countries. The international politics of food looms large over that and that's another area um, where I feel there are big fault lines at the moment. And that's all I've got to say, thanks. Thank you.
Um, again, to reiterate, a big congratulations to the Cherry family. What a wonderful event. It is simply brilliant. Um, this is a huge uh, challenge around the whole area of the politics of food. Uh, I wanted to sort of really touch on uh, three areas. One, the tipping point. Secondly, uh, change and why. And the third around opportunities. I think when you look at tipping points, there are various times through people's individual lives and of course within farming. We have seen some huge tipping points in agriculture. If you take, obviously, the war was incredibly disruptive. I know my grandfather was a, a tomato grower actually down in Hampshire. And uh, not only was it a big challenge keeping glass in one place during bombs being dropped all over the place, but actually uh, the changes post the war in terms of where money went and, uh, and how it was supported in terms of what was a dramatic change. And of course, we had diets which were led by rationing. And those actually created some fantastic uh, health factors. In fact, I'm often, uh, you know, I often wear a Fitbit. Um, I don't do as well as I should do. My husband, if I put the Fitbit on him, delegating my walking responsibilities, would have done 22,000 steps by the end of the day. In fact, he does 9,000 by 9 o'clock in the morning. He does get up at 3 o'clock. Uh, he is a dairy farmer, but I think it's this whole different relationship of time. So the tipping point back in 2001 for us was foot and mouth as an industry, and that created a huge and dramatic amount of change in business structure, advice, regional aspects, local foods, and things like that. We're at another place of another tipping point, and this one is even more dramatic. And it is, within it, a huge amount of responsibility but an awful lot of insecurity and, and things we don't know the answer for. So it's trying to recognize and be very strong about what it is we can be control on, of and actually how we influence those things that we cannot be in control of. Obviously, integrated farm management, just one I've got here in my little pocket, uh, is a key part of this. Uh, but it is in terms of these are some of the areas where farmers can be in control of. Soil management, crop health, energy use, pollution control, organization and planning right through to water management and things like that. But there are some real challenges around the tipping point that is happening now. If you look at the change and why, I often wonder who's the puppeteer out there? Who's the person who's really in control ultimately? Where does our government look for ideas, and of course some of this is around big climate change challenges, some around things like plastics, but also, you know, we live in a VUCA world. It is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. And those tipping points and that whole area in terms of actually the puppeteer, it's working out, actually, I believe, it's the sustainable development goals. So back in 2000, when the Millennium Development Goals were very much are around make poverty history and we're about developing countries. The SDGs that were drafted and crafted in 2015 were about what can be done in developing and developed countries. What are the things that we should be aspiring to actually deliver against? And agriculture is able to contribute to a huge amount of those, which is absolutely fundamentally key. So when it looks at the puppeteer, look up to the SDGs because those are the things that our government actually is measured against. And so when it comes to individual farms, it's working about what is then the relationship now that we have with government. Now, we could be incredibly naughty. The rebel within me sometimes thinks, it's going to be hard. They're not going to be in control of us. Uh, and I often think it's a bit like uh, we've got a new cattle dog at home. Uh, he's not actually often on a lead, but, you know, those extending leads. So you can have Harvey, unfortunate name, um, right next door to us, very close at heel. But on those extending leads, you can let them off and they'll go for miles. And Harvey thinks, this is brilliant, I'm free. Then all of a sudden, it's like, uh-uh, we're in control. And I think this is going to be an interesting one because government has been capable of actually managing and controlling farming. But in fact, of where things go in future, actually, what is going to be? You know, are we going to suddenly government be able to heal us in as an industry? Or actually, can we say, no, this is the opportunity for the marketplace? And of course, of that, actually, what we are delivering as an industry for public good. And as Vicky has highlighted and alluded to, there's an awful lot of what we deliver as an industry from a public good perspective. Therefore, we should be recognized for that. 
And I think in particular the challenge is going to be about many of you in the room here who have done an awful lot to improve soil management and an awful lot to do improve the environment. But actually those marginal gains are much harder. So what the natural capital will look like in terms of public good and support is going to be a very big challenge. And it's interesting to think of where, when we started, I've been working for Lee for 27 years, uh, when we started, you know, the environment was at a challenge. Uh, still challenges, yes, but as an industry, it is a far more integrated part of the values that farmers aspire and deliver. I think that's where the health agenda is now. It's kind of like, we know there's a problem, but we don't know what the solution is, and we don't know what our part to play in that agenda is as well from a farming perspective. So that's you know, some real leading on finally to opportunity. It is about clawing and making sure that farming is actually getting reward and recognition within the value for the food that we are selling. That we are recognized increasingly within the health area. Uh, one of our farmers recently said, I get it, I would like Holland and Barrett to go bust because actually people are looking to buy food and in the inherent vitamin qualities within that. And thirdly, I think it's that whole area of engagement with the public. Uh, we run Open Farm Sunday. Hats off to everybody who took part this year. Uh, 360 farms opened up, 270,000 members of the public went out onto farm. A real call to arms. But those increasingly urban members of society are not connected with seasons, are not connected with farming, and many of them not connected and understanding the quality and skill base within a really exciting industry. So building public support is absolutely critical, and those connections are, are very, very key to demonstrate the professionalism of what we have and the skill base of the industry. And when it comes to the politics of food, it is actually making sure that farming has a key part around the table in that place as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the Cherry family for giving me the opportunity to say even more things about, um, in this case, uh, food politics. Um, over the past weeks, I've heard very important people like Peter Backer, who's the uh, CEO of the World, World Business Council of, for Sustainable Development, based in, in Switzerland, um, and he said the food system is broken. Now, he's a private sector person throughout his life and career, um, but he said that. Um, Jeremy Grantham, who uh, puts millions into LSE uh, on climate change, but also on other ecosystems, um, he said the food system is broken and um, said it with very uh, persuasive evidence. A PhD researcher in the room today has said it's broken, and John Cherry just an hour ago said the food system is broken. So presuming that that's a political problem rather than an economic problem, um, let's have a look at this. I'm going to try to get across two points. The first one is about you know, the broken food system and then the problems of getting CA adopted. And they're both very highly politicized processes. What I'd like to get across is that the food system, this broken system, um, is only broken in parts. Um, there are three parts to it. There's the food production, which is done by farmers here in the room. Uh, there's food trading, processing, manufacturing, retailing uh, in the middle. And there's the consumption, the third part. Um, <coughs> the, they are very, they're very different in the way they run. Um, the food, uh, the production side is a failed economic system. That doesn't mean that farmers fail, it's just they're in a set of circumstances where because we don't value the, all the inputs that um, they handle and they, we don't value all the services they provide in their farming, um, we don't, it's not a sensible system. There's underpriced food, um, farmers would like to have properly priced food, they can't get it, so this is why it's a failed system. Um, this part is not a failed system. Um, if the value of um, the food is, should be this, but in fact they only get a smaller amount, that's evidence of, of this not working. But by the time it's gone through these other processes, the, the, the food system, it's added 10 times the value with lots of packaging and lots of other labor inputs and so on. 
So this is a system where government has taken the time, the energy, the a boring dedication to detail to put in rules, accounting rules, which account for all the inputs and all the outputs. Farmers handle 92% of the water in producing food, consume it. Um, they don't get any credit for doing it. There's nothing in the price to reflect the care they, do, they take to do that. This part accounts for only 1% of the consumption of water, but every cubic meter of that is accounted for and, of course, the uh, people that operate in this part, the, the big corporates, can say, we've halved our water consumption when it's only half of 1%. Where, as you can see, what farmers are managing, and we, we need to help them to become even better at handling water. So we have the difference between this um, is the fact that all the costs, all the input costs are captured, um, and they make profits and pay taxes. Um, but the difference also is that where are there's, there's perhaps 200,000 farmers um, in the UK with additional labour of perhaps 400,000, there are very many more accountants um, in this part and not so many accountants in this part. The third part of the food supply chain is the consumption side, where the failure there is rec could be recognised in the example of the United States, where they have food stamps which are part of the farm bill. Um, and 76 billion a year, 14% of the population, 40 million people in families um, get their food uh, via food stamps. Um, a lot of the people that work here in food processing and restaurants, of course, and, uh, and uh, sell selling food are part of the underpaid. So this system is what it is because it's there as a political economy to provide underpriced food for underpaid people. No government anywhere in the world wants to have apparently properly priced food. They dare not do it because it would be very unpopular, viscerally unpopular with, with the electorate of the consumers. So they just leave it and blindly don't do the thing they should do, which is to put the rules in here to make sure that everything is captured and it is a market. I do get very weary listening to farming today and sometimes much less often because they scarcely talk anything but anything important in um, the, the weekend program on television um, <laughs> because they put it across that you know, it's all a market and the farmers ought to be operating effectively in a market. They're not in a market, they're in the failed markets. So that's the, the first point I want to get, to get across. Um, <laughs> the second point is that you farmers in, in CEA, conservation agriculture, are obviously in a minority. We are very much aware of it, very much applauding the efforts that are going on to, for yet another experiment in which the farmer and the farming community, or part of it, is leading in the right direction. And it's not in holding the hand of either government or the private sector, the corporates, or science. Um, somehow, in addition to having the good idea, uh, you've got to somehow do the, work some political tricks to make sure that you tip the science community, which is going to be very difficult because government is not giving um, research money to CA, and therefore the scientists have no appetite to do the research in CA. I've been, I made this point already today in this room. Um, we are in a, a trap uh, where the right thing is to do the things which CA does, which is to value water, value ecosystems, and do all the, the right things by the environment. But we have a political system which is blind to that. We have a corporate system which is also pretending to be aware of it. Um, the fact that Peter Backer says it's a broken system means that you know, he's thinking about the right things. But um, the, the rest of the people in the private sector are not, in fact, um, they can easily pretend to care, but they don't uh, uh, care enough, because if they cared enough, they'd want to have contracts with the farming community that were more reasonably safe than they are at the moment. So we have a political economy, which is some sort of deal between governments and, and the corporates, and the thing that they are trying to make sure they do is to provide underpriced food to underpaid people, and in those circumstances, it's going to be a terrible struggle.
we do questions from the audience, I'll give you a mic. Um, thank you. That was three very different but provocative and very interesting and short um, interventions. That's fantastic. Um, I thought I'd ask the audience a couple of questions, if, if you don't mind. Um, about, I was going to be provoked by um, some of the things that have been said, but I did want to ask, um, if you were given the chance of just going it without any kind of, con I know this isn't gonna happen, but any government intervention at all, you could just do what you want to do, not getting any payment, how many, farm how many people in this room would put their hands up and say, that's what we want to do? I, I noticed the farmer earlier said, uh, in America they would, it's different, but you, Got quite a number. Just do what you want to do and no support. So it's about eight, eight or nine or more. That, that, interesting in itself. Um, how many of you would actually make a living if all the support was taken away right now with the same kind of prices you get in the marketplace? No, same prices, same system. So it's two, four, five, possibly. You'd, yeah. No, ab absolutely. So I was doing it on the same as it is now, but no subsidies. I mean, the, the evidence is quite clear that across the board, an awful lot of farmers would struggle financially um, if we took away the subsidies and didn't replace them with another form of support, unless the marketplace, as you say, changed and was regulated to play fairer um, in all sorts of ways, not just... Um, I wasn't going into that, but it could, you know, yeah, diversification is one option, isn't it? I think that's, it's talked about a lot, but then when I, when I see it talked about a lot in diversification, it's, um, it's seen as uh, sometimes too much of a solution for farmers, so it's such as diversifying out of farming. Um, but it's certainly an option. I think diversifying within the farming system, as, as we've seen in some of the farming systems today, certainly something to think about, but it's not, I, I, I mean, it'd be interesting if you, um, want to talk about that. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. But um, I think what I would like to do now is to um, ask you any questions you have of the panel about some of the points they made. Um, I think Tony's point at the end, um, the, the summarizing it as underpriced food for underpaid people, was quite a powerful statement. And from my perspective, where I work a lot on um, impacts on workers in the food chain of, um, of the way in which the system is, is currently run. I think it's very powerful for me, and we also work with food um, poor. We have a whole program on food poverty. Um, but I think it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on that. And Caroline's comments about the tipping point. Is, this is obviously a tipping point. How do we um, translate it into opportunities and the sustainable development goals? Um, and uh, making sure that the public goods that we're paid for actually um, are adequately paid for and um, that the health opportunities, I think that this is a very important point, but I've yet to see anybody um, really tease out how that could work in practice, how the agricultural bill, for instance, can actually make sure that we get healthier food in the marketplace because a lot, as, as um, one of the speakers said, a lot of that is driven by the uh, beyond the farm gate and the, um, the way in which the food is processed and marketed. And then David's point, um, what, what is going to happen once we have the agriculture bill in a few weeks' time? You'll get lots of secondary legislation, lots of new um, policy proposals and ideas. How are you going to engage in that um, and will you? Um, my last question actually before I open it up to you to ask questions. Um, would be about how much, how many of you have actually engaged with your MP um, in terms of politics rather than purely getting them around the farm, which is actually extremely important, uh, uh, very, very important. But I wonder if you actually had a conversation with your MP about the politics of food. Not so many, not so many. I did speak Oh, good. <laughs> right. Oh, well, there's a lot of work to be done there. The gentleman just said his MP was more interested in industrial um, and post-coal mining industry strategies. So there's, a, there's obviously a gap there, I think, given that you're farmers who are doing amazing and you may not think it's your job. But I think everything about food is political. Maybe I would say that. It's what I work on. But I think, I think it is. It's, it's just so fundamental to our lives and livelihoods and health and our environment that it is political. So everybody, I feel could be political in some way, and that could be talking to, to MPs. It could be d 
doing more um, publicity around what you do. Anyway, I'm, I will stop there. I've talked too much. I'm the, I'm the moderator. Um, so do we have any questions to our panel or particular comments? Thanks. There's one down there. Thank you very much. I, I thought for a minute you were going to ask my question for me. You got very close to it. Um, Caroline, you, you referred quite rightly that the industry is very much at a tipping point as uh, courtesy of Brexit. And then you went on to say that the industry should be recognised for the public goods that we provide. I think you mentioned change also, and I think the industry as a whole is up for change as evidenced by everybody here today. But I think the real question for me is the one that Professor Barling asked, and it's how do we as farmers make a profit? We are facing this cliff edge. Our businesses are entirely dependent on the profit that we derive from them. So I'd like to ask all members of the panel, please, a very simple question. A, should farmers be supported? And if so, in just uh, one or two answers each, how would you? Okay, do you want to go first, David? That's working. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the work I've been doing lately has been looking at unfair trading practices, and we've been looking at it across a range of European countries, um, and that is one of the areas that needs addressing. In other words, you need, you do need state intervention to uh, correct market imperfections, market failures, and if you look at the way that the proposed director from the European Commission has been phrased. It is very clearly about trying to make a more efficient food supply chain. And of course, farmers include that. And the reason why it's a particular concern to the European Commission is because they've got millions, literally, of farmers in Eastern Europe who are going to move off the land if they can't sustain a living. So the problem is extremely uh, raw there. In term so I would say the key thing is you do need proper regulatory frameworks, actually. It's not just about subsidy. It's about regulating the market failures and imperfections. In terms of subsidies, I think the subsidies for public goods is a wise one because the farm landscape provides values or value uh, which isn't taken into account at the moment. That's where you move to the bigger issues of how uh, you measure and, measure and regulate the externalities, both the benefits created by agricultural practice and the negatives. Tony. Yeah, uh, you would have guessed that I would expect there to be a political thing that needed to be done to solve this problem. Farmers are willing to do the right thing, I sense, certainly evidence on CA is that they're prepared to do the right thing. But we have this food system, which is arranged so that we have underpriced food. And that doesn't help in giving farmers a livelihood. So you and I, I as a consumer, you as a producer, everyone in the system, especially the consumers, need to give the politicians space to say something unsayable, which is what we need is properly priced food. I, now, I know that from my experience is so impossible to have, and I refer to my friend in the front row perhaps to comment on this, that no politician in opposition or in government can actually go to this place where properly priced food is, is the name of the game. So it's a breathtakingly difficult challenge, but we as food consumers do potentially have the power to ask our legislators to do the right thing, but at the moment they don't dare do the right thing. And it's quite interesting that you know, the first thing that happened when we started to get involved in Brexit was for, I presume the farming lobby got straight to government and immediately it wasn't just to 2019, it's going to be two, 2022, you're going to have the same playing field. Um, so it shows how <laughs> breathtaking political this process is. Have you asked Tony? I guess there are two ways. The first is make sure you do uh, the best job of those areas that you are in control of yourself. Uh, I think partly coming here today, uh, the sort of farmers that are in the room here today are the ones that are about making their business the best business within the restraints of what you've got. It isn't necessarily maximizing yields, but it is, I mean, obviously I'm slightly biased on an integrated farm management approach, but I think it is making sure that actually your business is as resilient as it can be. Those are the things that you are in control of. Uh, when it comes to the areas that you're not in control of, uh, but you can influence, uh, it is what's happening now. Um, 
there, there is nothing concrete on any sheet of paper from what we can all work out. So it is making sure that if there is a framework within the agricultural bill, that actually we start building sort of the skin and the muscle on the bones of that bill that are actually going to make sure that we have the best farming industry and sector in the world. And that has to be around making sure that we have all the facts and figures, that as an industry, all the wonderful technology that's starting to come through is used wisely in terms of monitoring and evaluation, because if we can't give evidence to our government about where the industry is not working, i.e. whether it's through not getting enough paid at the end of the line, or actually we need extra support because competitively we are competing against other European countries now, i.e. in the future, who are being supported for public good delivery, or America, who often say we're not supported, but actually uh, I, get, I, I know every single day where Sony Sonny Perdue is from USDA because America gives so much information. And so that's the sort of, we need information and we need to make sure that we are also dealing in information. Uh, and one of the areas around that, I think, has to be about making sure that we have enabling legislation and we have capital in where it ne is needed as an industry. And when it comes to the delivery of public good, we're actually getting a recognition for that, but we're also monitoring and evaluating it. Prefer, you know, well. I think there's one area, um, read the tea leaves, because uh, often, yes, you know, we don't know what the future looks like, but there are an awful lot of trends out there that are actually going to be very strong trends that we can be part of the solution for and we can support, but we've got to work out how we practically deliver that as well. Thanks, Karen. Can I just like, take a quick show of hands before we go on to the next question? How many farmers have done a, um, a look ahead even business planning, detailed business planning, in relation to what might happen to prices, say, in two years' time? Is that, is that an unfair question? Anybody, can anybody put their hand up? So you have done business planning with the view of Brexit impact. All oh, right. Cool. Because I did ask this question on Twitter. I got silence, apart from from a journalist. <laughs> and I think it's... it's it, it's interesting because I think it's very hard to do that kind of business plan when you don't know what the tariffs are going to be on your inputs or the tariffs on your exports or what you're going to be competing with. But you could do some scenarios, but that takes time. I, you know, I, but I think, Caroline, spot on we're talking about that because also you can use that to talk to your MP. I've got a bit of a common refrain here, but or talk to others uh, who might talk to your MP, you know, talk to your community and, and get it known that these things have got to be done properly and the as Karen says, capital needs to be available for the changes you might need to make ahead. If you are diversifying, if you are changing your system, you might need short-term support or, or um, capital and interest-free loans, etc. These are the kind of things that might help make sure that you can survive ahead. Um, sorry, um, we had a gentleman here with a question. Yeah. Uh, Tony Colvin, uh, I'm a water food academic, and Tony uh, and I published a much wider paper than the one he briefly explained. Mm. It's free, it's up on the web under the Oxford Uni University Press website as okay. Water Food Society. Um, I'm a, uh, also a former politician, perhaps the only one here, still plugged into the political system, but I'm also a farmer, a member of Anglia Farmers, the reason I wasn't here yesterday was so I was at the Royal Northern Show. Again, every farmer around the table said they want to have uh, a no deal, want to not have uh, support if it's at conditions, mm -hmm that the current European Union lays down, and that is unchanged for the last three years. Mm. So extraordinary uh, situation, um, and the farmers of Norfolk voted pretty solidly for Brexit, maybe mm. not round here. Mm. Um, my question, though, was about the big thing which is on the horizon, which is the change in the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, change. Mm. which has changed or moved on in its agenda from looking mm. at the emissions from energy, fossil fuels, food for renewables, mm. to emissions right. from agriculture. Mm. It's the combination of Sustainable Development Goal 2, which is agriculture, and 13, which is about climate change. The meeting at Katowice in Poland will be the first one we'll be looking at endorsing exactly what everyone wants in this room, which is no till, no plow. And 12% of emissions is coming out of for food for our consumption. Uh, another drop set for food for animals that we ultimately consume, 
events mm. coming from their issue. To what extent are the panel knowledgeable about this? Because the agenda is being set by Argentina and Brazil in terms <laughs> of what they see as the way mm. forward. And do they see, if you like, the 4 in 1,000 initiative that came out of the Paris Agreement, mm. whereby farmers get paid for sequestrating carbon in the soil, being something where they could use the rent, which is about keeping forests, as a way of having, if you like, an international system, which is based around carbon emissions, mm -hmm. being a way to support farmers around the globe. Okay, thank you. So I hope you, you all got the gist of that, how, how much the panel are aware of and, and support the, the direction of travel for the way in which agriculture is being brought into the climate change um, uh, negotiations and agreements and targets, um, which they are, and they haven't been for, properly for a long time. Who wants to go first? Oh, Tony, do you want to? Yeah. I've got the... <laughs> Thank you, Tony, for... I was wanting you to confirm that what I'd said was a good idea. I know. Than... <laughs> <laughs> okay. But on climate change, um, yeah, but future... Yeah, there's two voices to say it. Yeah, on climate change, clearly there are local, national and international processes in place. And at every stage and in every arena, it's a contentious issue because some people don't want to be uh, paying more or seeming to have a less secure livelihood because they've got to take into account um, um, the downside of climate change. I'm afraid I can't, uh, I, I'm rather unfortunately cynical about this in that I sense that um, when push comes to shove, um, the powerful um, will push their interest and they'll not take things into account. Um, but it doesn't help that, um, uh, that we don't have alignments of everything at all levels, and it, <coughs> it, because it makes it obviously much more difficult to negotiate an outcome. Uh, well, John Gummer was on radio uh, the day program this morning um, with the latest Committee on Climate Change report for the UK. And um, the point about that, and I think the key thing he was making, was there are binding commitments which uh, are across the industry. Um, they're for large energy uh, users currently in agriculture and food, yes, and they're in place. So the horticulture industry, for example, uh, are subject to the climate change levy. Uh, the point about that, of course, is these are binding commitments under the Kyoto Protocol. So while we've got di discussions uh, at the intergovernmental panel, that's still a very early stage of any uh, firm agreement which is, uh, should be bound by law. One good thing about the UK in the recent past is it has followed its commitments uh, quite rigorously in these international agreements. That's never guaranteed, of course, and we do know that one of the major food producers in the world is no longer part of that agreement, uh, at least a step aside from it uh, for now in the USA. So uh, the international politics of these things are very interesting. You're quite right. And you can see that across a whole range of international agreements and uh, standards setting. For example, in Codex, um, you see a whole range of different alliances of countries who have particular interests which they want to promote. Uh, it's nice for the farmers here and for those who are interested in no-till agriculture that those voices have got a strong, a strong steer currently at the Intergovernmental Panel. Whether that plays itself out in the subsequent um, processes by which this becomes binding targets on the floor, as it were, we'll have to wait and see. Mm. Caroline, did you want to speak up? No. Okay. Next question. You put another question? Gentlemen. Oh. Okay. Go there first and I'll come to you next. Good afternoon. David White. Um, I've got to rush in a minute and moderate okay. another discussion, so right. um, I'll keep this brief. There's a mention about underpaid food for, uh, underpriced food for underpaid people. Well, actually, I think it's undervalued food that mm. we need to worry about. Everybody here, um, we're trying to farm in a more environmentally friendly way and, and produce more nutritious food in a, in a more natural way. Um, I was fortunate enough to visit the AD plant down the road that many people will have driven past on their way here over the last couple of days, and they are processing 54,000 tonnes of food waste a year, mm -hmm. and that's one plant out of 13 in the group. 
And whilst the supermarket shelves are bulging and people buy food and put it in their refrigerator and don't mm. actually worry about using it, um, you know, I, I regard the fact that food is undervalued. And until our mm. population and our consumers start to value food more, they're not going to be prepared to pay for it more. Okay. Come on, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I totally agree, but uh, the price word gets it across more quickly to everyone. The value I am absolutely in accord with, but uh, using the word price gets the message across more quickly. Uh, of course, I agree as well. Uh, I think the, what's interesting, though, is there is a younger generation who are increasingly interested in food. 69% um, of millennials will take a photograph of their food. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they value it, they're interested in it. And I think what we have to do is work out actually how some of the um, more glamorous meals that are put across or whether it's been uh, the protein shakes. You know, I look at the sort of the, the milk calf powder that we have right through to the protein shakes in uh, health food shops, 53 pounds could buy it at Mill Valley Farmers, mate. Uh, you know, this, there, is a, a, there is a disconnect, and I think this is the real challenge. So for us, obviously, this is why Open Farm Sunday is so critical. We last year merged with FACE uh, to now form Leaf Education to actually really focus on providing curriculum-rich opportunities for farmers to deliver to teachers who are more confident in recognizing agriculture as a core part of GCSEs, A-levels, and things like that. Many of you all will know Tom Martin, and we're working with Tom Martin on FaceTime a Farmer. And we've now got 77 farm, farmers linked up with school teachers to actually, for farmers to deliver on a regular basis into lessons. And this is what creates value. You're, you're, you only have value of something when you appreciate it, when you actually understand it. And the more that we open up uh, and are honest in communicating what we do, how we do it, and the skills appreciated and developed behind that, the more it is. This is why farm assurance schemes are important. This is why if we can work from a government perspective with actually ensuring that there is earned recognition for where farmers have gone the extra mile, right through to the support payments for where they've gone an additional mile beyond that as well. I would just add, I also think we need to develop alternative retail markets and routes to market and cooperate cooperatives where possible to actually find alternative markets for what you're producing. So you can actually talk about what, you, what the value in your produce, but the point's very well made. Maybe we need to say value and price when we're talking about this. Can, so, can I just add that we, we pay three or four times for our mm. food. We pay at the checkout, which is the cheap um, underpriced side. We pay in the health costs. Of, yeah. So lots of and costs. we pay in the environmental costs, mm. and there are others. So. Yeah, there's a full cost accounting is not done for food. But gentleman there. Yeah, hello. Um, I'm just sort of really thinking about sort of added value and how successful mm. we've been in that, mm. um, and what uh, society is uh, willing to pay for, i.e. our customers, and actually what the government is willing to support. Mm. And uh, if I take uh, a situation of my own organic inspection, uh, which is you know, regulated by European law, what it gives me on average, as far as combinable crops is concerned, is round about £100 a tonne more than conventional price. And so that's what the customer is willing to pay for. Mm -hmm. And also a maintenance payment for the recognition of public goods in a systems-based mm -hmm. approach in £60 a hectare uh, that the government is prepared to pay for and that the, uh, cons the, um, the customer will also support uh, as far as uh, you know, their taxes are concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think really, I suppose this is a question to Caroline, and I think I'd ask the same question to uh, a representative of Red Tractor, is that what do you think you can do uh, to uh, emulate, actually, love it or hate it, what the organic movement has done for its members? You could, can you pass the mic? Um, well, we work closely within LEAF with the Soil Association. Uh, Soil Association, for example, have done a, a, you know, a cracking job, and the organic sector have done a cracking job, not only in actually creating a market opportunity for growers and a premium, but also writing within the legislation on an EU level with iPhone and etc. I think uh, what we feel that we can do... Um, what LEAF Mark and the principles of integrated farm management about are making the system work. 
Uh, we create the free framework of integrated farm management and it's through that attention to detail that not only are we looking at really making sure the impact on soil management is reflected in health, good rotations, and of course, additional and enhanced biodiversity factors. Um, so the system works. We've got increasing evidence around it in terms of making sure that framework delivers. In terms of the marketplace, um, we haven't Historically, we occasionally look for a premium market opportunity, but it is recognition in the market. And our growers that are LeafMark certified certainly will either get a premium or a preferred market status. And that, again, is something that you know, we work closely with the Soil Association in terms of recognizing how government can then take this forward. So we have earned recognition with LeafMark, with the Environment Agency, so that there is a lighter touch because we have increasing evidence having carried out over the last six years global impacts reporting in terms of demonstrating that our farmers are delivering for the environment. So for us, it, you know, we want to deliver more sustainable agriculture. Uh, this is not a competition. This is about actually making sure that together we work really strongly to look at what are the best practices that will drive that. So we're really pleased to be working with the Soil Association in Innovative uh, Farmers um, because... What yeah. Yeah. You'll need the mic if you're going to talk for a bit longer, so I don't know where it's gone. Is it gone? Okay. Okay. So the gentleman was talking about making sure we do the job of getting the added value from organic and other farmers, retroactive, actually rewarded and recognised. It's just regulation upon regulation, but actually we're doing the supermarkets job for them. You know, if we're yeah. going to produce the best, safest food in the world, we need to get some kind of recognition that we need a champion to help mm -hmm. us get that extra added value. Yeah, okay. no, uh, a very good point. <laughs> I think, so, apologies if I've misinterpreted your, your question, I think where we can work now is within um, the discussions that are going on. You know, I mentioned about the puppeteer. This is my, the, you know, I, I, I often have, you know, in The Sound of Music where they've got the goats all puppeteering, etc. I often visualize that as how government works. The problem is they're all not on, this, they're not on the same stage. And I think this is a real challenge for us. And so it's really, really important, as you say, that we effectively sit around the table to demonstrate to government all the self-regulating and also the independent external verification requirements and standards delivered by farmers are recognized going forward. I think the challenge is going to be is that government has always been in control. Uh, government wants to see a private-public partnership going, and that's, again, good, but I don't think they know where the NGO sector and where farmers sit within that whole area. Um, and I think it is, as you say, it's working out, one, where we can actually place those discussions effectively, and two, making sure that we are going with a united voice. So ourselves and Tom McMillan and the Soil Association have sat down together to work out what is the question that we're actually trying to answer for government. And I have to say, that is one of the challenges in terms of what can we effectively deliver? Because if we create a situation where actually government is then saying, well, that's fine, we can put all the regulation into uh, the farm assurance schemes, we're then in a difficult situation because actually both ourselves, Red Traction and Soil Association, have a governance that is built around best practice in terms of moving forward on a regular basis. So if we then say there's another government that comes in and says, it's okay, we don't want to do agriculture, we want to do just plastics or we just want to do something else, then we have lost the spirit and the drive of what that framework is. So there's some real challenges, certainly within this case. While you're passing that to David, I would say there's also a huge challenge with the Treasury. They, they were convinced many years ago that organic did provide particular cost savings and therefore you got the maintenance payment. But I don't think they're in that place anymore. So we've got a big challenge with the Treasury to deliver the public good payment. Uh, Sorry, just, David. Yeah, just very quickly to add a sort of food value chain uh, or a food chain dimension to the, your comments, uh, your questions. Uh, the first is uh, the assured combinable crop scheme was 
introduced by the NFU because they didn't want the retailers to be in charge of those assurance schemes. It was a deliberate plot, it was a deliberate attempt for the producers to have to shape them. Uh, the second is that many years ago I worked, uh, I was on the DEFRA uh, committee for the Organic Action Plan for England. And during that period, the goal was to get the same level of UK organic produce, in particular produce areas, bought as imported because the import uh, was selling more than the domestic. Uh, and we got quarterly reports about how different sectors were doing. And on the fresh produce, they suddenly made the levels they wanted in three months. And the reason they did it was because Tesco's took their organic vegetables and fruit and moved them next door to the conventional ones rather than putting them separately. And then when consumers looked, they saw there wasn't that much price difference between the cucumbers or the courgettes or the carrots. And they managed, because of their market uh, presence, to lift uh, the targets to the desired level. So the answer lies not just at the government recognition level um, of production, but it also lies at uh, the gatekeepers to the consumer. OK, have we got time for one more? The gentleman that you had to respond at the back. And then if you could think about what you would... Um, uh, what do you think the next political issue would be when we've left and when we've gone into the next phase of the uh, land management scheme? The bill's in place, we've gone through transition. If you think about what, what might be ahead, just to look ahead. Um, question, please. Hello. Um, I work for catchment sensitive farming and we have quite a lot of freedom in the type of agenda we would like to set within our farming communities which we represent in terms of which sustainable practices we would like to promote. Um, but no-till, for example, is still quite a minority pursuit in agriculture. So how would the panel recommend we promote these kind of practices without making it a completely top-down approach? How many farmers are we talking about then in the group? Is it a group of farmers or? Well, no, no, we each represent hundreds. Okay. Yeah. So how would you recommend promote no-till? David, you've got the mic. <laughs> well, I think probably the answer lies uh, at this conference, actually. It's um, through the networking and uh, innovation networks that, are, that this, I think, is an example of. But the wider innovation networks being put in place, for example, uh, through the Dutchy um, Soil Association scheme, we've got a tent here. I think that that sort of farmer network is the way forward for transferring techniques. And indeed, of course, that by definition is not top down. So a groundswell every, a mini groundswell every month. Is that all right? It's Cherry family here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I've made a number of interventions over the two days indicating that uh, great things have been achieved by this farmer-led movement. Uh, but I also, in the previous se session or earlier session, um, got from John Landers the idea that there are moments when, when there are tipping points, mm -hmm. and we need a 1996 moment. The 1996 event took place in Brazil, Brazil when Ambraca you know, said, we're going to do it. So you, the farmers will find mm -hmm. it difficult to get as many people as should be doing uh, CAA to do it, but until they get some, you know, their hands held to some extent by the private sector, by the corporates, and by the government, and okay. especially by science, but science only does what the government mm. and the corporates. Yeah. Okay. So that tipping point. Mm. I mean, I think also show, the show and tell is is by far the, one of the best ways in terms of people actually understanding and recognizing and valuing the opportunities for their individual businesses and what is appropriate for their individual business. Um, I mean, I think ultimately, yes, it's the, some of the political agendas that can turn things, but actually it has to be right for the farm business. And so it's, it, we work with the leaf demonstration farms, of course, and they are inspiring individuals who look at both the right and the wrong in terms of what works, and that's what drives change. And Caroline, did you have any thoughts about politics after... 
Oh, well, politics 2022. I, I would actually have a little plea, if I may, Vicky, yes? uh, of a little bit shorter term, which is around actually. Uh, I'm going to be sitting on, uh, I am sitting on Dame Glenys Stacey's group, right. which is looking at inspection and regulation. Uh, so I would make a plea and a request that if there are, uh, so that we're looking at the regulation, there are 196 pieces of regulation out there. Regulation is to prevent harm ultimately. Uh, if you look at the processes that we have in place to be the inspection bodies, we have the Environment Agency, but there's, you know, there's a huge structural change that's going to be delivered. This is, this is big change going forward. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dame Gladys is very keen in uh, is knowing which bit of legislation that you are having, you have it, you experience, is, is just actually hindering other things uh, in your business. And if there are pieces of regulation and examples of not only bad practice, encouraging bad practice or preventing good practice, please could you let me know because this is what we've got to drive the change. This is the opportunity. Great, talk to Caroline after, afterwards. Did you have one point about the point, what might be happening in politically and after the transition out of Europe? Mm. Yeah. Very quick, well, sorry, only a couple of sentences. It's just there are so many uncertainties. One thing is certain that it will be an option that the deal with farmers to 2022 will be pushed for another two or three years mm. uh, because that's okay. the only safe political thing to do. It could be that the words of uh, Mr. Gove wanting public goods pay properly paid for will um, worm into the activities and the legislation. Let's hope it does. But if it doesn't, well, certainly farmers will be protected, I sense. OK. Delays, but protection. Yes, I'm, I think a lot does depend on the outcome of the next general election as a result yeah. of these uh, intervening years. Um, a couple of years ago, my wife asked me, because I'm a close follower of the political scene, if Donald Trump would be elected. I said, don't worry, he won't be. She said, are we going to stay in Europe? I said, don't worry, we will. Uh, nobody asked me if Leicester City would win the Premiership, thankfully. <laughs> Very good point. Well, can I have a round of applause for our speakers? Then we'll have to end it there. Thank you. I'm not sure if there's anything happening here next. Anybody? I haven't got my schedule, but I'm sure if we can look. Thank you. Thank you very much.